Hello and welcome to uh, Laser Santa Fe. This is our fourth laser of the year and our 10th laser uh, Santa Fe. Um, our second year, we're, we're uh, finishing up our second year of offering these lasers. So if you are not already familiar, what is laser? What does that mean? <laughs> it's an acronym. Uh, it stands for Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous. And Leonardo, what is Leonardo? Uh, Leonardo is a, um, an organization of art, science, and technology that has existed now for over 50 years. It's international. Uh, they publish a wonderful journal called the Leonardo Journal of Art and Science, uh, as well as the Leonardo Music Journal, uh, all coming out of MIT Press. And about 10, a little under 10 years ago, um, a group in San Francisco, where Leonardo is located, uh, decided to start these lasers. And they, they gave them this name, and they wanted to have an opportunity for uh, informal presentations, uh, talks uh, between artists and scientists, or people who are pra practitioners of art science. Um, and since those first lasers in San Francisco, it's really exploded. There are over 35 lasers around the world, and we are so proud to um, uh, be selected to be a laser affiliate city here in Santa Fe. Um, we are, um, we, when I say we, we are SciArt Santa Fe. Uh, we are a now, finally, a not-for-profit not 501c3 um, here in Santa Fe. And our main people who have been involved in creating this, um, who I want to thank here, uh, are back with the camera taking stills, Amy Pilling, who totally organized this whole thing and did all the press and all that. And you got emails from her and all that stuff. So I want to thank Amy. She usually hides in the background. So. <laughs> And she brought the cookies. Um, also, um, thanking Jared Rendon Trompak, who's uh, been um, uh, going to be videotaping tonight, and we'll be placing that online for you to see. Um, and um, and then all of our community, um, my co-organizer of Laser, Susan Latham, who I'll say more about in a moment. <laughs> she also is our featured speaker. Uh, and then members of, of our community, uh, Fred Unterser, who is always coming and, and helping and also uh, was featured at a, at a laser. Um, of course, Tom, who uh, is another one of our spe featured speakers. Paul Biaggi, and I just want to give a special thank you to Tom and Paul because they also um, uh, contributed uh, to support to this laser uh, tonight. So thank you so much. Um, I did that online. So um, uh, just, a, just a word about SciArt Santa Fe. Um, there's a little there's a little paper over by the cookies and the water um, that talks about um, SciArt Santa Fe. Uh, also our co um, organizer of SciArt Santa Fe in the back is Morgan Barnard. Um, and uh, we, you can find more information about us at sartsanafe.org. And as I said, we are now a 501c3, so you can help to support us. And there's going to be a number of different ways in which you can do that. So please look for that. Uh, Laser Santa Fe is the main thing that we do, but we do many other art science projects. Amy's involved in lots of educational outreach projects. There's a lot um, going on. Okay, before I introduce our speakers, um, one thing that the laser international community does is a community share. And so they have very strict rules and we follow them. Um, in under one minute, we ask members of our community, people who came here um, tonight, if you would like to stand up and just uh, tell us something about what you're doing related to art science, uh, we can do that now. And can someone Time. Oh. Yes. Okay. okay, so strict to one minute. Stand up, so I want to be sure to see these oh, okay. So strict to one minute, would someone like to share? Okay. 
No. <laughs> Fred? One minute. I'm doing a lot lately. Okay. <laughs> Fred is a pioneering um, a holographer, um, does incredible work both in, very much in the uh, art science uh, crossover field. Um, so look for him. Paul? I'm uh, just finishing editing a third book uh, called The uh, Dancer from Beyond. It's about how art through dance changes consciousness and mm -hmm. throws over a uh, post-apocalyptic tyrannical regime. Well, I'll say that again a little louder. It's so profound. A post, no, no, please. <laughs> a post apocalyptic tyrannical regime, kind of a la Trump. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Sorry if anybody ever offended anyone. Well, I want to say uh, Paul has been part of my science and art group for many years, but uh, Paul dances almost every day of the week. So, whatever he's writing, he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Anyone else? Share what you're doing? Yes. Uh, I'm Paul White, and uh, I have uh, several meetup groups. I have an art meetup group where I post events like this. Oh, uh, I have a um, poetry and prose meetup group, and I have a travel group. I'm also a glass artist. I work a lot with a, a lot of um, interesting kinds of glass called dichroic glass and uh, currently I'm setting up a glass blowing studio uh, or will be and I'm um, planning on working with lasers and, uh, and uh, other kinds of um, technology fiber optics with glass. So, more to come. <laughs> been doing some educational work uh, through STEAM NM and we just were working with some sixth to eighth graders who are college bound probably, they're advanced kids and uh, we did a bio art workshop with them and one of the things that really struck me was uh, we had them draw for 20 minutes and then we had them sculpt for another 20 minutes and their teacher mentioned at the end, she said this is so great, they never get to do this at school. And it really struck me. They're just like, there's so much going on and there's so much delivery of content and assessment that they don't actually have time to settle down and just do creative work. So. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Earl Jennings. Uh, my uh, daytime activities are primarily patent law and uh, uh, computer architecture research. My uh, evening or early morning activities are usually late 20th and early 21st century theoretical physics with uh, some interest in anthropology and uh, agronomy. Awesome. In the front. I'm uh, Brooks Bowman. I'm a photographer in town. And I've been working recently with a, a printing Epson printer that is a carbon-based printer. So it, it actually is only throwing carbon on the onto a, a page. And so it's an interesting, interesting way to carbon sequester in a very small <laughs> Is that uh, electrically conductive? So you could do circuits? Uh, no. no. Okay. <laughs> Why haven't we even tried that? I don't think it does that. There, is, there are printers like that too. Uh, anyone else? Ah, Morgan. Uh, Morgan Barner, uh, digital artist here in Santa Fe. Um, Currently, actually working with Andrea on a project where we're using electron microscope um, photography of air pollution to create sculptural forms for a fellow art project. And it's been really fun playing around with different approaches to uh, creating forms and generating forms from these inspirational images. So. Anyone else? So, you know, I did think about him doing something. Okay, <laughs> I, I heard that would be a lot. One Actually, day we'll talk about I'm working on a couple projects uh, for the next current uh -huh. program here. One of one of the um, it's a well to impress you. It's an off-axis Fourier transform multi-lens holographic optical element. Basically, it's a mandala project with pure light. And then I'm also working on a piece that talks about. Uh, a, a piece that always points to the exact magnetic center of the Earth. Mm -hmm. So this is the current project somewhat. Mm -hmm. 
But you didn't hear it from me. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? I'm Karen Blaha. I'm a scientist at Sandia Labs. Um, but I've just always been really interested in the arts also. Um, I play with pop-up books and trying to design some of those. Um, just kind of whatever I find interesting. Um, yeah. Karen's books are amazing. <laughs> and make sure these people sign up. Right. Right. <laughs> Any, anyone else? This is, this is such an incredible group. Even <laughs> the people I'm seeing that didn't say anything. Uh, please be sure to introduce yourself to the people who shared. Uh, if there's something that interests you, or uh, just mingle. So well, uh, we, we will have a Q&A at the end. Uh, you may think of Tom as our scientist and Susan as our artist, as I sometimes do. But truly, we have two people here who are both artists and scientists in, in a true melding from the beginning. Um, I, I, and in addition to that, we also have two people who are incredibly important um, uh, community leaders in art science in Santa Fe and throughout New Mexico. So Tom, uh, who I first met in around 2011, um, 2012, uh, was run, uh, the director of the Innovation Center at Intel, really the creator of that Innovation Center. Um, and. Um, uh, I worked with Tom uh, because he supported a major um, uh, art science uh, symposium that uh, I was involved in called ICEA, the International Symposium for Electronic Art, um, in 2012. And Tom managed to uh, get Intel to support uh, that uh, project and was really instrumental in a lot of the projects that surrounded that. It was, it was uh, statewide. Um, about 90 different partners statewide. Uh, but Tom has also worked with Currents, of course, which has already been mentioned. He's a member of the board there. He's worked with Cachette Dance Company. We have many, a number of people who are involved in dance and performance here. And um, makes incredible glass sculptures, which I'm sure he will talk about. Um, but as well as being obviously a leader in, in, in technology, working at Intel and technology and, and innovation. Now on to our really featured speaker, Susan. Uh, today, Susan Latham. I met maybe about three years ago. Um, trying to, uh, moving to Santa Fe, when I moved to Santa Fe, trying to find out, well, what's going on in art science here? Um, and I, everybody pointed the way to Susan and said she had, had been and continues to be so instrumental in holding together the community here in Santa Fe in science and art. Um, she started the SciArt Network um, at the forum for, uh, for SciArt uh, that was at the Santa Fe Complex for many, many years and uh, has really been the driving force of these lasers and of SciArt Santa Fe. Uh, as well as being an incredible artist, you'll hear about her artwork here. And, but I don't know if she's going to mention, so I, she asked me to, to particularly mention um, that she has a degree in occupational therapy, uh, which is a kind of a generalist science uh, degree as well. As, and, and that degree at the time was, uh, you were saying, the only one that you could do a well, science major and a yeah, I wanted, art minor. <laughs> the day I graduated from high school, I declared that I wanted to get a major in science and a minor in art. So I go way back. And that was, that was the options at that time. So anyway, without any further delay, let me turn it over to Susan Thank and Tom. You. And let me get the slides set up real quick. Two things. OK. There we go. Well, I am honored to be the Leonardo speaker tonight in one of my favorite galleries, the elegant Evoke Contemporary. And where is Catherine? And Lon, I want to say thank you. Hello, thank you. Uh, also, uh, I'm so pleased to be here with Tom Greenbaum. Now listen carefully. Tom is a multifaceted, multi-talented, multimedia science artist. And he is was willing to present with me tonight. So thank you, Tom. Thank you, Susan. 
Uh, one of the important things that you need to know about the Leonardo laser uh, talks is that their intention is to educate, inspire, and to demonstrate uh, science and art in action. So tonight, I'm going to do my best to uh, share with you my experience of this, um, the melding of these two disciplines and how they structure and energize my creative process. So um, I also promise you that I'm going to highlight moments where that flash of inspiration hit. You know, that's kind of, boom, that's where something new is about to emerge. The title of my talk is Why Not? Now, it's very appropriate that this title is a question because there are so many unanswered questions in the science of knots. However, my friends, there is one question I do know the answer to, and that's why I not. <laughs> but before I give you that answer, I want you to come with me back in time. We're going to go to the National Genome Center in Santa Fe. It's 2009, and I'm there with the Forum for Science and Art. That's the group that I was uh, shepherding at the time. One of our speakers, Richard Kramer, a mathematician on sabbatical from Princeton, was the one giving the talk. And it, the title of his talk was Knots in Math and Knots in Nature. Well, I was enthralled right away. <laughs> uh, beautiful images of, of knots, you know. And all of a sudden, I saw them as sculpture, sculptural forms. And I thought, well, what might be? And you know what I came up with? A big, fat, velvet, nautical knot. And I thought, well, I'm going to make that. You know, it was just in my mind. Now, meanwhile, Richard's probably talking a lot about math, and I'm probably not paying attention. <laughs> but I had that spark. And um, it didn't take long for me to uh, talk Richard into helping me to configure the knot. Now, this is it. Now, it's 30, 30 inches by 25. So it's, a pretty, it's pretty big. Actually, it's the biggest fiber sculpture that I, that I ever made. But it is a science and art because I had my uh, friend Richard help me put that together. So um, now I want to get back to my promise. I said, well, I will tell you, why do I make knots? Well, the, the first thing that I need to say about myself is that I am a phylomorph. A phylomorph is a lover of form. And it's, all, it's always been that way. So I notice things. I notice the shapes. And the idea that I could be uh, creating new forms and shapes just with fiber. Um, now, th that may be surprising to you, but because I'm best known as a metal sculptor, but I have fiber in my, fiber in my fingertips. And that, uh, that is because of the tutelage of my mother, who was an expert seamstress. When I knew her, all she ever sewed was Paris originals. Pardon me. But then, I, you know, I got to thinking, um, Clothing construction is very much like sculpture. It's 3D. You see it from all sides. You have to uh, engineer pieces that fit together, right? And it was only recently that I really gave my mother credit for all that art education uh, in 3D. So. Um, I wanted to say, no, the next thing, the next reason, I think we're on number three. No, 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 we don't change it yet, Tom. <laughs> so I think I did two reasons why. Uh, the third reason, uh, the, the main uh, focus there is experimentation. I can create a fiber knot, live with it for a little while, 
and then say, well, what else could I do? Undo it and redo it in very short order. Now, I want you to know you cannot do that with steel. You can't do it with bronze. Uh, so that uh, working with the knots afforded uh, very easy experimentation. And don't we all know, as artists and scientists, that experimentation is really core with the process. Uh, then one more thing is just, well, it's just this kinesthetic sense of fiber. So if you've been welding steel at the community college, trying to learn to weld, I might say, and come home to your studio and you get to play with velvet, so that kind of contrast uh, pleased me. And the, and the thing is that there are well, millions of knots and look at all the fabric. So the possibilities of combination, you know, with fiber and knots is what really um, delight, delights me. So now I'm going to show you uh, the fiber knots that I have made so far. All right, this, um, this is, it's about this big, uh, it's a sphere, and I made some very fat knitting needles. And I, I had to have a stool to prop the ends of them up. I don't know why I made them so long. But anyway, so I made a rectangle, pulled the top and bottom, and I had a sphere. Uh, guess what this one's called? Yes. Knit knot, of course. <laughs> and the next one, uh, this is called ember, embers. Uh, for this one, I made a, a very large crochet hook. So what you're seeing there is a very long, simple crochet chain that I just knotted and entangled. Now this one stands about this high. Oh, I keep doing that because it's hard to. All right, all right. Um, this sculpture is made of iridescent raspberry Italian silk velvet. And in the sunlight, it emanates a little blue glow. So I found this fabric in New York City one time, and I kept saving and saving. When I got into the knots, I said, that's it, you've got it. Now, this sculpture has inspired poetry. And one of the phrases I like very much, the memory of our iridescent raspberry silk entanglement lingers longer than I would like. <laughs> so there's a lot more poetry, but that's good enough for now. And the last one, oh, I did it again. Well, we have that right here. So, well, let's just leave it where it is right now. Uh, this one is not velvet because I want you to know it's very difficult to find velvet striped fabric. <laughs> uh, uh, this is called vortices. So all the linear entanglements of, of vortices is what I saw for that one. I haven't made any new knots lately, but I'm just so grateful for this opportunity to revisit them and to tell you that well, well when, I, when I was making these knots, I didn't know anything about other knots. So they have, they have uh, presented themselves, you might say. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you how that all got, how I, you know, got that shift in vision. Tom, would you get me this book here? Okay, here we go. The Genesis and Geometry of a Labyrinth. Now, how many of you have ever had a book fall off a bookshelf in front of your feet? <laughs> huh? Can we see a raised hand? <laughs> and you found that that book was really important. Yeah. Well, that's the story with this one. But I, I think the word geometry is what stood out for me. And uh, so I started leafing through it. And it's, this book is just full of very complex knot diagrams. And I thought, well, What's that all about? I didn't show you a slide on it, but if you want to, yeah, here's a bunch of them. So then I, so I had to buy it, and the first thing I found out is that 
technically speaking, a labyrinth is a knot. Did, who knew that? Did you know? I didn't know. <coughs> well, this book has been a portal. It has been an ex given me an explosion of the powerful presence of knots in the universe, in the human body, in scientific research. So I'm very grateful, and I want you to know, I've spent a lot of time with this book, but there's still so much I don't understand, and still so much to learn right here. So could we have a hand of applause for this book? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now. Oh, I forgot to tell you that, that one of the most important things that this book um, told me about was knot theory. How many, how, do you know what knot theory is? Anybody into it? You've got, a, are you a specialist in it? No. Oh, well, I, okay. Well, it was a brand new uh, concept to me. And I found out that, that in recorded history, uh, knot theory began in 1771. So they've had a long time to figure this thing out. It's, it's like, almost like a secret society because it's very complex. So all I'm going to tell you is some of the basic rules that I, was, I learned. What we're looking at here is uh, a chart, in a sense. Uh, now these, all of these configurations are approved knot designs from this knot theory group. Now, you see what's different? They're open. Don't we have knots that are tight? Nautical knots are bow and so a knot, um, a knot theory knot is open and it has no loose ends. So you, they take the loose ends and they connect it and then you have a circle, right? There's no circle up here. But guess what a circle is called? An unknot. <laughs> now, I did my best. I, I dove into the internet. I, I did physics videos and, you know, I mean, I know, I don't know how many, but that's the science part of me where I have to find out. And, uh, but inevitably there was some point there when they lost me totally. I mean, well, here's, um, here's one thing. Um, there can be two knots that look totally different, okay? But to the knot theorist, they are the same because of the number of crossings in something else that I don't understand, maybe you do. <laughs> but anyway, I had what I needed. So what did I need as an artist? I needed some new, a new you know, limitations, some rules of, with which to design. Now the first thing I saw here, I didn't see math knots, I saw, I saw uh, jewelry, necklaces and pendants. So that's the first part of this inspiration. Now, whatever inspired me, by the way, this officially is a uh, uh, knot theory. It follows the rules, okay? But I added my, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, this is the next, oh. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Okay. Now this beautiful young woman is Clara Mondalova. She's a mathematician, a PhD candidate, and I met her at the Bridges Science Art Conference in Stockholm last summer. What you see there is Clara doing her research paper on my sculpture. Can you imagine how thrilled I was? And here is the sculpture. Oh, I did it again. Okay. Now there's a story there that I don't have time for. How did Clara happen to be doing that? Well, as I said, uh, maybe I'll have to give another talk. But it's an interesting story. So, so here's Clara. <clears throat> Look at all that math, geometry, I mean, uh, algebra. This is only part. It goes up and up like that. I don't know anything about that. What I did was to take a symbol, the Vesca Pisces, I scored it and folded it. No math, but in order to have this, this configuration, this 
um, shape verified by the field of mathematics, it took Clara's analysis like this. It's another world. And uh, so then, uh, then uh, you see, the conference this year was in um, Austria. Now, I was not able to go, but I heard that they were having a um, math art fashion show. Bingo. I said, I'm going to make Clara a knot theory necklace to wear on the runway. <laughs> and she did. And this is, this is what she chose. She chose the one. Oh, Tom, wait a minute. Yeah, there. Uh, she chose the one on the right. So that's what she wore at the fashion show in Austria. Now, well, you've got to see the real thing here. This is wire that's been wrapped in yarn. So if you have a boat neck, you go like this. If you have a V-neck, you go like that. <laughs> uh, and that's the last one I'm going to show you. Oh, I did it again. Uh, so can you, d j does this follow the math uh, formula for knots? No. Okay, Tom, let's hear it. Why? Because um, you've got a, uh, an intersection of three uh, lines coming together. Right? No? Am I wrong? It's the other one that's wrong. So through to that one. Oh, oh, it's, it's dangling. It's oh, it's that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was supposed to roll that and tuck it in a little tighter, you know? Well, thank you. I will tweak that. I'll make it work. Because what I saw, oh, it's open, it's loose, but then, yes, there is a loose end there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your support in this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that intersection a problem? Excuse me? Is that intersection at the top a problem? Mm -hmm. Well, it probably needs to be wrapped. I wrapped the some of the wire with um, fabric. Now, I'm inviting my whole family for Christmas, and I'm making four math art necklaces for all the girls in the family. All oh, right, now. Oh, did I tell you I was going to do three things? I was going to, I was going to talk about art knots, why I make them, knot theory, and why it inspired me. I did forget that. So this is the third thing that I promised, and that is nature, the amazing nature knots and their esteemed position in the forefront of scientific research today. So the first one is my favorite. How about that? This is a protein knot. If I could just design a sculpture as beautiful as that, how about that? Yeah. So it leads the parade of nature knots that I'm about to show you. But before I show you that, I have to tell you something important, and that is that I am a student of the master designer nature. Her geometry and her whimsical, fabulous creations, really, that's what inspires me as an artist. And I, um, I will always, you know, I just always know there's something wonderful waiting to inspire my work. Now I have to check and see what's next. <laughs> oh, I know. The nature knots that I'm about to show you, the reason I've selected them is they are, in my mind, the perfect examples of her outrageous, brilliant uh, imagination. So here we go. Now this is a tiny, twisted, molecular biology knot. Looks like rope, doesn't it? Yeah. 
This is a quantum knot related to the topology of string theory. Now, who'd have thought? Isn't that amazing? This is a knotted protein. Now, a knotted proteins are proteins whose backbones entangle themselves into complex knots. Now, can you imagine that? All on its own, just entangled? You know. So all of, and the, oh, I hit, see, we have one more. Um, what I would like to say, what I did, if I found, well, like the first one, the protein knot, then I had to go dive into the internet. I wanted to see all the protein knots. <laughs> so I invite you to have some fun, explore that. It just, it's endless. Um, now the next one, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. 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 No, 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 this one. Did I already talk about that? Yeah. Well, that was the wrong knot. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, but it is a protein knot. It is a protein knot, yes. Doesn't it look sort of like the wrappings of a gift? You know, how you scroll in? And then the final one, uh, this is a quantum knot. And um, according to my notes here, that the physicists has created this, and for them it was a, an absolute breakthrough. So, there are many unanswered questions in the science of knots. And you know, even the research scientists really don't know exactly what's going on. Like, why is a knot so powerful? Why is it so useful? Um, but, so, even in DNA, quantum physics, they're all puzzled to a certain extent. How are they created? And why, you see, they're, they tur it turns out that they're very, very useful in scientific research to decode some of the secrets of nature. So it's way, way, way beyond me, but I can stand sort of wrapped in awe, you know, that, and uh, it occurred to me that maybe this universe of ours is really held together by a series of complex knots. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if that's good news or not. <laughs> but um, As long as it doesn't unravel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Uh, but what, what I did want to say is that um, my, my talk began with a question. Why not? And it's ending with even more questions. But the happy thought is that science thrives on questions, doesn't it? What would science do if it ran out of questions? So that's the end of my talk, and now I'm turning it over to that brilliant, multifaceted, multimedia guy, <laughs> Tom. <laughs> and I get to sit down and watch. Thank you, Susan. It was, um, it's really been my pleasure to work with you and, uh, and Sci Art Santa Fe and Andrea again uh, is, is, ama is amazing. And um, I, I, I'm just a little bit of this presentation. It's really about Susan and celebrating Susan. I just have three slides. But uh, I want to. Oh. Well, I'm going to go back to Susan and her uh, inspirational discovery of knotted proteins. And this is an interesting one. This is very complicated. And it is the major cap capsid protein of human virus. So... Of human virus. A human virus. It's, um, in, in other words, a virus which will infect a human being. Yeah. All right. And a capsid... No, no, us as virus. Oh, well, we're... Some of us are, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, so to explain what a capsid is, uh, uh, it's the protein shell of a virus particle which surrounds the nucleic uh, acid content. So really, a, a virus is, is a shell which is very, very strong, uh, to, so strong to the extent that, um, you know, we don't know how to really break into it. You know, our way of uh, countering viral infections is to protect the cells somehow 
from being invaded, but we don't really, we can't really violate the protein capsid. It's so strong. And then the nucleic acid is a very simple strand of nucleic acid, which it then delivers into the cell, and then the cell starts producing more viral pr particles. Very simple mechanism, which scientists um, think, uh, you know, have the question, is this a, a, a living uh, organism, or is it something else? We, we still haven't, I think the jury is still out on that. But uh, isn't that beautiful? The, the five-way symmetry is, is amazing to me. Does it, does it come that way? It, yes. This is uh, actually like multiple proteins that were, are knotted together. So there's, you know, uh, five uh, proteins uh, surrounding this. Uh, it's kind of a, a vertice, and I'll show you in a second. So... Um, the colors are so... Well, the colors, okay, so this is not a microscopic image, right? This is some scientists um, a simulated uh, visualization in a computer. It's a computer-generated image, and so they're using the colors to differentiate different parts of the virus, of the, of the protein. And, of course, proteins aren't really ribbons and, and strings, but, you know, they, these are atomic structures, right? This is, these are molecules, and so... I mean, if you really did a deep dive, these are atomic bonds and atoms which are all connected together, right? Um, okay, so the five-way symmetry is why. Uh, why do we have the five-way symmetry? Because the capsid is an icosahedron. Who knows what icosahedron is? Hands. Aha, uh -huh. yes. So icosahedron is a platonic solid, right? It's a, uh, this is a spinning icosahedron in the center. It's 20 <coughs> equilateral triangles, and they form a sphere, and this is the shape of the virus, capsid. And you can see the five-way symmetry at the vertices, yes? And that's where that protein resides, and then it interlocks with, um, there's 12 vertices on an icosahedron, so there'll be 12 of those uh, protein and knots, which then interlock to form, you know, the capsid. And these are my uh, sculpt glass sculptures on either side, which were inspired uh, by the icosahedron. And um, why the icosahedron for me? What was the inspiration for me? Well, back in design school, uh, I became a, a fan of Buckminster Fuller. Who knows Buck? Ah, oh yes, very good. All, hands up for everybody, pretty much. So Buckminster Fuller, you know, the uh, designer of the uh, geodesic dome, right? Mm -hmm. And they, they uh, uh, a lot of different uh, structures which are based on principles of geometric um, design which come from nature. So Bucky says that there are three building blocks in the universe, and that's the tetrahedron, the octahedron and the icosahedron. Those are the three. And so, is it any surprise that, you know, we have viruses that are used that basic building block, the icosahedron. It's the most symmetrical of, of those building blocks, you know, in terms of uh, surrounding space. It's the most efficient uh, container in terms of surface to volume ratio. Right, so that's why geodesic domes are very efficient structures, very strong and, and very lightweight. They span in uh, large volumes and, and yet they protect, um, you know, uh, what's inside. And so why, then there's no uh, doubt that nature would be using uh, that structure as a, uh, to encapsulate its uh, RNA delivery system <laughs> in terms of a virus, right? Um, Tom, how big are these? These are, uh, well, it's about the same as this uh -huh. one. This is, so this sculpture spinning around here, this here is, um, was my virus um, mm -hmm. uh, model that I created for um, the uh, Art and Science of Systems Biology e exhibition mm -hmm. in 2010, and it was exhibited at the uh, uh, Santa Fe complex. So, um, 
I, I've been involved with uh, the Santa Fe complex um, way back then, and uh, and I was uh, uh, motivated by that up upcoming exhibition, and I was so fascinated by viruses and, and the icosahedron, and I said, I have to make something for the exhibit. And that is the sculpture right there. And um, you can see part of my inspirations were these uh, electron photomicrographs of viruses you can see here. Uh, it's, um, this is what, you, what it looks like under an electron scanning microscope, right? Scanning electron microscope of virus. And yeah, it, that's magnified, think of it, that's magnified 80,000 times. So that's how sm small a virus is. Um, and um, th there's 20 kiln cat, so I'll just walk over here real <laughs> So you can see um, the 20, 20 equilateral triangles. And uh, those are uh, kiln cast uh, glass. And uh, what did I use? I used recycled glass. I used Bud Light lime bottles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I found that um, we had plenty on hand. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, if, if you uh, take a, a, these bottles, you clean them up really good, you put them in a kiln at high temperature, and then you take it with a tongs and appropriate uh, uh, protection, and you drop it into a bucket of water, they shatter into tiny little pieces. Mm -hmm. wow. And then those little pieces, I can then uh, create a template, put it in the kiln, so I have these nice uh, um, uh, panels, and then I um, uh, silicon glue them together. That's uh, not anything special silicon, but uh, then I have the, uh, the virus up here, and it is penetrating my version of a cell wall. This is a partial version. And it's like, you know, the cell wall is really in distress here. You can see it's all, this is slumped glass. So it's the same kind of glass, but then on a stainless steel uh, salad bowl, um, you put the glass on top and then it melts down. It drips in the kiln, you know. And uh, after many different firings and adding glass, and you, get, you can see it's all slumped and it looks like, oh my gosh, here's the virus, <laughs> you know? Uh, and then, but you know, in terms of the size, it's not really proportional because a cell would be very large size compared to, this is just a little piece of the cell. And then I have the copper wire spiraling in there, and so the virus has penetrated the cell wall and has injected its RNA uh, nucleic acid which is the blueprint for the cell to now be creating <coughs> viruses, you know? And um, so that's, that's my sculpture there. Kind so. of creepy, Tom. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a creep, yeah. But <clears throat> this is also but interesting. Beautiful. But also interesting is it's, uh, it's called, the virus in particular is the adenovirus. So who knows adenovirus? You all know it because it's a common cold. So, yeah, that's the common call. That's what's great in your sniffles. But uh, anyway, now it's back to Susan. So thank you uh, for my little deep dive and being part of your show. Thank you. Well, I'm really I'm not going to talk about these, but uh, we'll just show a couple of, of um, my metal sculptures. <clears throat> now, um, this one I see out of my big picture window of my home. And I'm looking south, and the east is that way. So in the morning, not right now, but during spring and summer, the shadow moves all the way across the adobe wall. And in a way, it, it's a, a sundial, you know? So if I don't look at the clock and I come out in the morning and say, oh no, it's past eight. And all I have to do is look at the shadow. <laughs> uh, but this is a spiral, but it looks like a knot in the shadow. Um, you know, in, uh, in the fact that we are uh, initiating a, a new science art network in Santa Fe, I was thinking about all of the pathfinders that came before us. Leonardo, of course, to begin with. 
And then we have, well, I've included Einstein and Bucky Fuller. <coughs> what else do we have? We have um, oh, Johann Goethe. We can't leave him out. So I just love to think that we're here in this moment in time, but we are part of this historical line and how we inspire, how they inspire us now, today. So I think they should be honorary members of our organization. And with that, I, I think, come up here with me, Tom. Come on, we'll say that that's it. <laughs>